Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fred Van Dorp. I'm the Budget Division Director with the Department of Local Government Finance. I wanted to thank you all for taking the time to attend this, though, the today's webinar. This is a continuation of our webinar series. This one focused on property tax caps, specifically as it relates to key points during the budget cycle. So on our, our, our goal is to post the 2022 circuit breaker reports for all units in the state of Indiana before May 1st. This webinar is uniquely positioned on the calendar to give us a chance to talk about what that report is, what that report means, how it can be used and, and, and how it can be used before we release it. But we'll always include the uh, the memorandums as we're posting uh, documents like this one. A webinar gives us a chance to do a much deeper dive into the into the content. Now, before we get started, I want to do just a, a, a little bit of housekeeping here. I want to start by saying this isn't an introductory uh, presentation into into the for the department or into the concept of circuit breakers. And so if you are new to state government or new to the concept of uh, circuit breaker, uh, would encourage you to after the webinar or to, to, to stick around for the webinar because I think it contains a lot of good information. But if you've got questions afterwards, I want to use this as an opportunity to encourage you to reach out to your local DLGF field representative. They are currently listening to the webinar right with you, so they are hearing this information again. They'll be, they can assist you in trying to figure out well what it is we're talking about and how it uh, impacts your unit. Additionally, this presentation is a continuation of a webinar that we gave just about 365 days ago. Last year, when we were during the webinar series, we talked about circuit breaker, but that presentation is focused on the same topic, but it looks at circuit breaker from a, a tax bill standpoint, where these numbers come from, what it is, why it, how it is generated, and how it is applied to units. This presentation is going to take, while it's still relating to the same topic, it's going to take a slightly different perspective in focusing in how units interact with those totals, how units uh, uh, use circuit breaker values as they're working through the budgeting cycle. So if you are, the the link on the page is a link to the uh, the actual webinar that we recorded last year. There's also a link for the slides. The two presentations are designed to sort of be used sort of in tandem with one another. Uh, our goal is to build as, as, as comprehensive a picture of circuit breaker as we can. Future webinars will continue to sort of develop these topics. Okay. So, like I said, last year's presentation really focused on the, what the property tax caps are or the circuit breaker, where they come from and how they're calculated at a tax bill level. This year, what we want to do with the webinar, what we want to do over the next hour is discuss the relationships between circuit breaker and the budgeting cycle, specifically as it relates to three sort of key periods of July, December and then April. And to do that, we're really going to examine the, the form three and the form four B along the way. So it's the same topic, just a, a slightly different perspective on it. More specifically, we're going to start off with a quick definition, so we're not going to do a, a, a real deep dive into sort of defining circuit breaker since that's covered in the uh, related webinar. We'll do a couple more definitions just to make sure we're using the common set of language. Uh, throughout and then from there we're really going to jump into the timeline really examining an 18 month window from the July estimates that that come out through the actual circuit breaker numbers that we're that we are preparing to release and then as always we're going to finish this up with uh, just an examination of other resources and contact information available to 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 the local government officials yeah. so let's let's dive in here so again very this slide is very short. Know that it is really the distillation of the of the 60 minute webinar from from last year. And while it defines what a circuit breaker is or what the property tax caps are, it goes it. There, there's still uh, plenty of room to discuss it, really understanding uh, how those impact our uh, the, the budgeting cycle. So you won't find the, the reference to the caps or to the circuit breakers in Indiana code. The reference to the circuit breaker caps exist in the Indiana Constitution. Article 10, Section 1 outlines a limit, a, a maximum property tax liability that any taxpayer will face on a, on a yearly basis. If the 
if a taxpayer receives a tax bill that exceeds this cap, the, the a credit will be applied to the bill for the difference. So if I get a bill that says I owe 1100, but we can calculate that my, ma but that my maximum bill is 1000, what I will pay is 1000. So that $100 that we're referring to, that's the circuit breaker. That's the circuit, that's the circuit breaker credit that's applied to the that's applied to the bill. With the idea of by applying the credit, no taxpayer will pay more than their constitutional uh, maximum amount for a for a particular for a particular year. For the folks on this conversation, you are uniquely sort of suited as private citizens and as property owners in the state of Indiana. When we talk about circuit breaker, we can talk about it representing a savings on my bill or on our bills. My bill said I owed eleven hundred. My cap, my maximum tax bill was a hundred was a thousand. I saved a hundred dollars because of the circuit breaker caps. Now, professionally, as local officials or as people who are working for local officials and the financial advisors out there, recognize that circuit breaker has another way of interpreting it. For local government, circuit breakers can be envisioned as a loss instead of instead of as a saving. For a particular taxpayer, I thought I was going to collect 1100, but because of the circuit breaker, I only collected 1000, meaning I lost $1000 of revenue because of the circuit breaker. So we can see why the department is so vested in making sure that local government understands what circuit breaker is. Since many of our budgets are at least partially funded by property tax, any loss of revenue, specifically loss of revenue relating to the property tax levy, can potentially mean that the budgets that we are certifying don't have enough revenue to support that particular appropriation. And that's what we're seeing on the bottom half of the screen. For this, for this unit, they have a certified appropriation. They've got planned spending, planned, approved, adopted, certified spending of $24,000, of which some cash, some non-property tax revenue, and as we see, the $14,316 of property tax levies are going to be used to fund that level of spending. If the circuit breaker is reducing the amount of levy that they're going to collect, then there's a, always the possibility that they won't have enough money to afford that $24,000 worth of spending. And so it feels like the circuit breaker is a pretty constant uh, topic that the department presents on. It's really so that we understand that while the budget order contains a certified levy, circuit breaker is one of the reasons why a unit may not collect that full amount. Okay. Now, before we jump into the timeline, there's just three quick definitions I want to I want to put out there. Any reference to levy, we're talking about property tax to be collected. Any reference to the maximum levy, what we're talking about is the maximum levy that the unit can adopt and that the department can certify in any given year. Now, that maximum levy, that 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 maximum that we are that the department's not going to let you that we're not going to certify your unit in excess of may be spread across one fund, may be spread across five funds, may be spread across 10 funds, depending on your, your unit. What we are enforcing is the circuit break, sorry, the maximum levy cap in aggregate. So regardless of the number of funds that you're going to be spreading your levy across, we're going to make sure the total of those specific funds don't exceed your maximum. And the third definition I want to just throw out there is if there are any townships that are in attendance, especially those townships that provide fire protection, you have more than one max levy. And what this means is that you've got one silo of money that we're going to make sure that you don't exceed for your civil funds, like your general or your township assistance, and you have a separate silo for your fire funds. And so if you, you can potentially max out one silo without maxing out the other one. So there are units that have more than one maximum levy type. Okay, so with that in mind, let's, let's, let's move to sort of the calendar. One of the first interactions you have, at least from the department's perspective as it relates to circuit breaker, is when the department releases its annual July estimates. Before August 1st, statute requires the department to provide each unit that levies property tax with an estimate of circuit breakers 
for the uh, for the for the ensuing year. We know that with budget workshops starting in the middle of July and with the importance of getting a number into the universe. We have for the last few years been able to have this number or these values posted for each unit. In the first week of in the first week of July. Now, in the other presentation, we go into more detail on the subject, but. One of the downsides to releasing an estimate this early in the system or sorry this early in the process is that we don't have access to the actual information we would need to actually calculate the circuit breaker for example before august 1st we're not going to have the cna values that we're actually going to use to calculate your tax rates we won't have the tax rates that you've advertised that you will end up advertising and adopting we won't have a listing of all potential debt issuances and their dollar amounts that may not be finalized until November or December of the year. Since we haven't begun advertising and adopting budgets, we can't answer the question of which funds are you planning on using this year? Which which ones will you advertise? Which ones will you be adopted? We won't have a listing of your approved excess levy appeals that could end up increasing your your maximum levy either temporarily or permanently. This information isn't available by August 1 but the department is still going to try to put out an estimate for the circuit breaker that could be impacted by any of these five items. So without access to those five, what will the department use instead? Well, we do have your historical circuit breaker profile, and so we're going to use the last three years of your actual circuit breaker to try to come up with an estimate of what we think is going to happen next year. We're also going to factor in the max levy growth quotient, knowing that levies are growing across the state. We're going to use that to try to factor that into the calculation for how much uh, potential, how that may increase the amount of circuit breaker loss that, we're, that we are seeing. Also, the information that you provide to us on your pre-budget survey helps us give an idea of whether or not you're going to be applying for excess levy appeals or planning on issuing debt. The information that you're going to provide us in addition to using what it's, what it's designed to do, we're also going to use that to help estimate our circuit breakers. When that information has been compiled, this is the style of report that we're going to end up posting. And so we've got three separate examples that we can take a look at. For the counties that are listening, for the cities and towns and for the libraries, what you're going to see is a report that looks like the example one, civil max levy fund credits estimated impact. And so with units like those that only have a single max levy, what we're saying is we think you're going to have $50,640 of circuit breaker. For the townships that are in attendance, since you have two separate maximum levies, we're going to give you two separate circuit breakers. One circuit breaker estimate amount for the part for your civil funds, like your general or your township assistance, and a separate circuit breaker amount that you're going to spread between your fire and say your cumulative fire funds. For any cities and towns that are in attendance, specifically those that serve as the provider unit for fire protection territory, you'll also see two separate circuit breaker estimates, one for your civil funds and then a separate number for your fire territory funds. So how do we use those numbers? How do we use those numbers? Well, the department's estimate is a single is a single total, but like we said, in uh, before August 1st, we don't know if you're going to if you're planning on having one fund or three funds or five funds that are going to share that maximum levy. While we are calculating our total circuit breaker impact, how a unit would use a report like this is to think, if I'm going to give 50% of my levy to my general fund, then my general fund will also get 50% of my estimated circuit breaker loss. If my township assistance is going to get 10% of my maximum levy, then the township assistance fund is going to get 10% of my estimated circuit breaker loss. The more funds you have, the more that you're drawing it down, the more funds will ultimately end up, um, you'll be estimating the circuit breaker impact full. Separately, the department will also post the total circuit breaker estimate in Gateway on your form three, and this accomplishes a couple different things for the department. One, it helps give us another sort of visual cue. Instead of just, instead of having to go out to the department's website, we will be posting that information in a, in gateway on a form that you're ultimately gonna end up using. So you'll get a chance to see 
what we're estimating your circuit breaker uh, impact to be. Two, it is also a tool for taxpayers to see. So in, in our example here, we can see that the unit's maximum levy is 11.8 million and there's an anticipation or the department estimates that we're going to lose 380,000. So taxpayers can see separate from the levy that you're going for, is there a portion of the funding that it is unlikely that the unit is going to, uh, unlikely to collect. Number three, we've, uh, circuit breakers have been around about 12 years by now. And so what we want to do is make sure that we're continuing to emphasize that circuit breakers do impact our budgets. So in since the DLGF estimate is largely built on the actual circuit breakers that have existed, what we have an idea of is us barring something out of the ordinary happening, how much of the levy that the that the unit is actually not going to collect. The second place that we are actively going to engage with the circuit breaker or chronologically that we're going to be exposed to the circuit breaker relates to the form 4B. And so before we cover where how we populate that on that on that particular form, this is an opportunity to say with the challenges available to the department and with the timing in which we need to calculate the circuit breaker estimate statutorily, we I want to make it clear that the units are not required to use the department's estimating when compiling their budget. We are going to try to calculate the circuit breaker uh, profiles for 2,500 units and, and 5,000 separate individual max levy types. You will have more time with the information. You will, and you can, you and your financial advisors may be able to come up with an estimate that you think more accurately reflects what your profile is going to be. If you want to use the department's estimate, we will make that available. But if you look at the department's estimate and decide that you think it's too high or it's too low, you are Ab absolutely within your rights to use a different number than the one we made. All the department all the department requests is that you consider the impact on most of your levied funds. The exception here, the caveat is your debt fund. If you have a debt fund, while they may experience circuit breaker loss, we're not in a position where we will eat for your debt funds. During the certification process, if you have worked in an estimated circuit breaker loss for your debt funds, the department will, re will remove that total as part of the certification process. Okay. So on the 4B, as you are uh, working on completing that one, there is this uh, the button that's circled in red where it gives you a place where you can add the levies, the, the rates, the tax caps, or the, or the school transfers. When we click that button, it takes us to the part of the form 4B where we can put in our estimated tax cap losses by fund. Now, many of you have been around long enough to remember that. There was a time when we used to include our circuit breaker losses on the form one as an expenditure, but when we revise the form 4B, this is where we are reporting our circuit breaker losses as a reduction of revenue. So, uh, as such, the estimated circuit breaker, I'm sorry, the estimated property tax cap loss, the estimated circuit breaker will always be reported as a negative amount. When we get to the 4B, what we're ultimately going to see on line 11 is the actual uh, advertised levy or the adopted levy, depending on the, the depending on the column. But we'll also see where the unit is acknowledging that there's a portion of this levy that we may not collect. It's important to note that these two lines are separate for a reason. Line 11 should still contain the levy that you are trying to, the, the levy that you are seeking, the levy that we are going to advertise to the taxpayers that your board is going to adopt. Line 12 uh, is designed to represent the portion that we don't think we're going to collect of that total. It's important that we keep those two lines separated so that the department is certifying and that we are attempting to collect the maximum amount of revenue available for each for each unit. Okay. When it comes to estimating circuit breaker, it's a difficult proposition. I said this morning that it's the Goldilocks paradox. There are unit can run into problems if it goes too high or it goes too low with their estimates, and it's the it's the same issue whether it's the department's estimates or the ones that you're locally calculating. 
since circuit breakers represent a reduction of revenue, if you estimate too high or you estimate you would lose too much, it could impact the amount of revenue that the department thinks is available when we go to certify your budget. On the previous slide, we looked at a levy of 2,500 and a circuit breaker loss of uh, 300,000. Sorry, a certified levy of 2.5 million and an estimated, estimated circuit breaker loss of 300,000. What that tells the department is we think that there is $2.2 million of revenue available. If that revenue doesn't support the level of spending that you are that, that you are advertising and adopting, we may reduce the amount of appropriation that is available, right? We will reduce your budget because we don't think you have enough money for it. So it would seem like we should estimate a lower number. If we estimate too low, we risk putting you in a position where we have approved a budget, but you're not actually going to have enough money to support that spending. So let's go back to that previous slide. We thought there, so we we're seeking a $2.5 million levy. We think there's going to be $300,000 of circuit breaker losses, but let's pretend as if we said there was no circuit breaker loss. We're going to get the full 2.5. Well, the department's going to assume that you're going to get that much money. We're going to approve that budget. But if you don't collect that money because of circuit breaker, because you lost 100,000, you lost 300,000, you lost 800,000, your budget is still going to show approved spending of a certain amount, but you're not actually going to collect the revenue. So here's the position that we're in. How do we estimate without going too high or without going too low? What we're going to see later in the presentation is how we sort of mitigate the risks of either of either of those two extremes. Okay, so Okay, so there's one more time where we're going to engage with the circuit breakers, but I need to sort of lay the lay the lay the groundwork for when we're going to see them for the third and the and the final time. Once the department has reviewed and approved all 2,500 budgets statewide, we're going to issue the certified budget order. And while the circuit breaker amount isn't explicitly listed on this report, it is included or the impact of that circuit breaker is included in that certified budget amount. Once the budget order is finalized, the department will provide the local county auditor with a listing of all units, all funds, all rates. The county auditor will load that information into their tax and billing system and then use that to simulate every tax bill within the county. Once that process has been completed and there's some there, there, there's a review performed by the state auditor's office and, and, and by the department. Once that simulation has been completed, the tax bills go out the door. Simultaneously, the county auditors are also providing the department with the actual circuit breaker losses for the actual parcels for the actual tax bills. The department uses that report or uses that information that's provided to create a final circuit breaker report. That final report, which is what we're looking at on the screen, contains significantly more details than the version that we posted originally in, in July. In July, we posted a single number that said, we think your circuit breaker estimate is going to be 50,000. In May, what we're going to end up posting is a report that looks like this. First two columns are identifying your specific fund and your specific fund code. Next column can be traced right back to your budget order. Here's the levy that was certified by the department. So this is the amount of money that we worked, that, that was advertised, that was adopted, that we've worked into your budget. Here's how much money we, we, we originally sought to collect. The next column, levy based on abstract AV, is worthy of its own 60 minute presentation, but I will summarize that down to just a, just a sentence or two. Based on changes to the assessed value between August 1 and when the bills went out, as a coincidence, the levy based on abstract means when we sent the tax bills out, we actually billed more than what we originally certified. So we sent out, we built a budget thinking you were going to collect 3.9, but when the bills actually went out, they contained $4 million worth of property taxes on them. Okay. Worthy of its own presentation, but that's the difference between those, the, those two columns. How much? did we actually try billing for? 
the next column is the over 65 circuit breaker, which is covered in more detail in the in the other webinar. But this is a limitation on the amount of bills paid by a very specific uh, subset of our of our taxpayers. It's the next column where we talk about circuit breakers in the more traditional sense that constitutional limit that all property owners in the state of Indiana, uh, the maximum amount they can end up paying. The next column sums the over 65 with the total circuit breaker. The final column uh, focuses on the difference between the levy based on abstract minus the total circuit breaker, right? How much did we actually bill for? How much did we, how much is actually uncollectible, leaving us with a final post circuit breaker adjusted levy? The last two columns are worthy of their own presentation also. This gets into the idea of protection. We are envisioning another webinar where we talk about why different funds engage with circuit breaker in a slightly different way, but not not won't be covered in the during the scope of today's presentation. OK, in summary, when the department releases its report in May, what we're looking at is for this school corporation, we thought we originally certified that they were going to collect three point nine million dollars. That's how much we built into their budget. When we factor in the impact of circuit breaker, what we're looking at is they're only going to collect three, three million nine hundred ninety one thousand four hundred and thirty dollars, or about ninety eight percent of what their certified levy is. But every unit's circuit breaker profile is a little bit different, and so let's look at another example. And this is another report taken directly from 2021. We started off with an original certified levy of 11.2, billed for 11.3, but when we start factoring in the circuit breaker loss, they're only going to collect about 10.3, or the maximum amount they're going to be able to collect is 10.3. This particular unit is losing about 9% of their certified levy to circuit breaker. In our third and final example, again, this is a municipality taken from 2021. They, when we when we look at them, started off with a certified levy of 10.2. When we start to consider the circuit breaker impact they are having, there's a chance that they're only going to collect closer to 7.6 million dollars, or about 75, 74 percent of their certified levy. So, as the department has, as the department is made aware of this new circuit breaker information, we are not going to go back and recertify the actual budget orders. We're not going to go back and say, well, now that we see what your actual circuit breaker is, we're going to go back and change your certified budget order. We will host any number of webinars. We may have the field reps do outreach, where we'll release the memos, but your original certified budget order stands independent of this new, this new data that's available to us. In the previous three examples, we were looking at the relationship between the certified levy and the circuit breaker adjusted levy, but what we haven't done yet is examine the estimated circuit breaker losses that the unit had accounted for as they were going through the budget process versus what actually happened. And until we take a look at that sort of that next step, we can't fully appreciate whether or not the circuit, what impact that circuit breaker is going to have in the budget. Let me see if I can say that another way. So let's go back to our last example. Started off with a certified levy of 10.2, an actual circuit breaker loss of 2.7 million. So when they were working on their Form 4B, when they were populating that circuit breaker estimate, let's say that in scenario one, they estimated that they were going to lose $3.7 million. Well, if they worked into their budget that they were going to lose 3.7, and now we know they lost 2.7. This is the equivalent of finding a million dollars. We built a budget, assuming that there would be $3 million of losses and there's only $2 million of losses. That additional revenue made up, made up that additional revenue means that the unit may have a, an opportunity to revisit some of those projects that may have got pushed off a year because of lack of resources, or they may use this extra million dollars to increase their operating balance. Just we're not going to appropriate it. We're not going to spend it this year, but we know that our budget is funded and there's likely going to be more revenue or more cash available at the end of the year than we really than we originally expected. This is not a bad scenario to be in. Plan for the worst. Get the good news when when the actual circuit breaker report comes out. 
let's contrast that to scenario two, where same facts are in place, except when scenario two was, was sort of being envisioned, they estimated that their circuit breaker loss would be 1.7 million instead of the actual 2.7. So what does this mean? So this is where we we're talking about before. Well, the department built your budget assuming that you were going to get more money than is actually available. And while your certified budget isn't going to change, there is now a risk that you will not receive enough revenue to support that level of spending. The department encourages all units to go through a process once the actual circuit breaker numbers are available to compare and contrast the amounts that were used on the Form 4B or on the 1782, if, that's, if, if that is more readily accessible, to the actual circuit breaker amounts by fund. As you go through that reconciliation, you're going to find yourself in one of three scenarios. There will be some of you that find out that your circuit breakers are perfectly estimated. You thought they were going to be 2.7 and they actually came in at 2.7. It tells you that your operating balance is safe. You are, your budget is likely going to be fundable by the amount of revenue. You didn't get surprised when you found out the actual circuit breaker number. Some of you will find out that you overestimated the circuit breakers and or that you used the department's estimate and the department overestimated uh, the what the circuit breakers were going to be. This is like scenario one. Now that we know that, it tells us that our budget is likely fundable. It tells us that we're likely going to collect as much revenue as we thought we were going to. And now we've got decisions that we'll need to make at a local level of what do we do with this additional cash? Do we appropriate it this year and find a, a project that we can spend it on? Or we just use this as we start considering our next year's, our following year's budget. The third group, and the one that we're, the one that I'm most interested in, or the one that I want to, the one that I want to spend the most time talking about is scenario two, or this number three on this particular sheet that talks about underestimated. The property tax is less than the anticipated. We thought circuit breaker loss was going to be one number, and it came in worse than we expected. We're losing more than we thought we were going to. In those scenarios, what you have is a couple of options available to you. One of them is we accept that the circuit breaker loss was worse than we expected, and we will use our expected cash balance to, we, we will see our expected cash balance go down, but we're not going to change any of our spending priorities in the upcoming year. Other options may include the local level. They may decide, okay, then there are some projects that we were considering that we should potentially postpone until un, un, until they're supported by revenue. Until we've performed this reconciliation, until we've compared what we worked into the budget to what is actually happening, it is unknown which unit or which silo a unit would fall into or which fund falls into which silo. And so we'll talk more about that second note here in just a moment. This slide just really restates what we were just talking about. When you perform the reconciliation, the recommended, uh, encouraged reconciliation, where we can find ourselves in one of one of three groups. Now, from a reconciliation format, the department would recommend that you include the the following pieces of information: that we examine the circuit breaker at a fund level, that the in our reconciliation, we are using the circuit breaker estimate, either the one that we put in the gateway or the one that you can find on your 1782. We look at the actual circuit breaker uh, value from the from the report that the department is going to post. Would also encourage you to use the operating balance, either from the from the 4B, either taken from gateway or from the 1782. And this is a real, real easy mock-up that we're that we're putting together that that kind of outlines what we're looking for. If we look at that bottom row first, we've got a total certified levy of three point, uh, sorry, $31.4 million. We estimated that circuit breakers were going to be 450,000, but what we're looking at is that the actual circuit breaker is only 377. At a unit level, it looks like we're in the overestimated group. But when we start evaluating this at a fund level, we can see that that's a little bit different than what we were expecting. If we look at line one, if we look at just the general fund, what they worked into the budget was $100,000 of loss. But when we compare that to what the actual loss of the general fund was, this fund was underestimated. Circuit breakers, was a, circuit breakers represent 150,000 more than we thought it was gonna be. So 
what impact does that have on the unit? This is where the operating balance really starts to pay dividends to include. We thought we were going to end our budget cycle with 14.3 million because circuit breaker is worse than we thought it is. All other things equal, we're going to end up with 14.1 instead of 14.3. Uh, on the other side of the coin, we can take a look at the second row, this election and registration. Estimated circuit breaker loss was 50,000. It came in at $715. So same idea. We thought we were going to end the year with an operating balance of 978,000. Instead, we're going to end the opera. We're going to end the year with an operating balance over a million. So part of the reason why we encourage to take a look at this at a fun level is while the unit total gives us a sort of a general idea, doesn't quite tell the same story that it does if we look at this or we examine the same sort of procedure at a at an individual fund level. Okay, so this, like I said, this is a continuation of an ongoing of a, of a topic that is near and dear to the department's heart. It's likely we will. This won't be the last presentation that we give on on circuit breakers. If you have questions about these, please put them in the chat box, and we will put them in the chat box, and we will work on including responses to those. If you're looking for a longer conversation, we'd really direct you to your local DLGF field rep. They can show you how to find these various reports on the department's website. They can help you to they can help you to understand which bucket that you the, that you are finding yourself in. And while they can't provide legal or financial advice to you with you know, the emphasis on the financial, that doesn't mean they can't discuss what your options are for you to ultimately make a decision on what makes the most sense for your uh, uh, for, for your for your political subdivision. Okay. That's 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 all we have uh, at the moment. Really want to thank you for uh, taking the time to 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 come to today's webinar. Hopefully, this uh, giving you a lot to think about. Um, potentially opens up the, the the lanes of communication between you and other local officials, or uh, you and the the department. If there's anything else we can do, please please let, please let us know. And otherwise, enjoy your Wednesday. Thank you, Fred. Uh, this is Jenny Banks with the DLGF again. Just as a wrap up, if anybody has any questions, you can submit those into the chat box. We'll leave it open for a few minutes. Also, and just as a reminder for anyone that joined late, we will send out an email with the PowerPoint, the video, the survey, and the CE forms um, later this week, and you'll receive those. It will also be posted on the DLGF website, so you can find those at either location. And also, uh, just as a reminder, if you did not receive a confirmation email for this webinar or for uh, future webinars, please make sure that you go ahead and re-register for those webinars in the future so that you can receive the instructions, uh, email, and also the follow-up email. I want to thank you again for participating today, and thank you to Fred for um, giving us our presentation. See you next month.